for evidence-based practice. Uh, and uh, Laurent is, as many of you may know, from Canada. Kind of. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm very happy to be here in, uh, for many accounts. One of them is they actually give me a tag with MD under my name, which I, I did ask what it's about, and they said it's for a medical doctor. And that's that fantastic. For 15 minutes, I will have the opportunity to make my parents proud <laughs> because they always wanted to me to be a doctor. And uh, as you've guessed, it, I'm actually not a doctor. I'm a physicist. Uh, I've got a PhD in physics, which I guess give me uh, different perspectives on also integration in many ways. Um, but before I, I can do this presentation in, in many ways, I'd like to, I'm not familiar with this type of audience, so I'd like to know who is very um, uh, familiarized with the, all the orthopedic side of also integration, like orthopedic surgeon, and uh, the rehabilitation side, and the biomechanics, really the get analysis type of things, and the others. Nobody. All right. Okay. Um, so what I'll try to do is to give you an overview on the work we're trying to do on, uh, with transfermal amputees. I'll skip very quickly on those, those uh, preliminary because I guess most of you are familiar with that. Uh, you can obviously fit a, an amputee with a socket or you can now fit them with an osteointegrated <laughs> implant. If you do uh, use the implant, I've got a, a little quick video that sort of uh, details how you take the legs in and out. So let's give you a, an, an idea that's actually a lot more easier than uh, with the socket. Um, the other advantage is you can actually restore the gait a little bit better. This is an amputee in London who couldn't work before the surgery. So let's give you an idea of how well the gait is restored. but I'm guessing most of you are actually quite familiar with that. Um, what I'm trying to do within my modest contribution, I should say, within osteo integration is twofold. I've got a, a vast interest to understand how MPT works and how do they organize themselves to uh, get as functional as possible. And my, um, my interest as a researcher is to understand the nature of the interaction between the prosthesis and the rest of the body. But my main focus uh, working with patients with osteointegrated implant, and particularly the one fitted with the OPRA system, is to try to shorten the rehabilitation program and try to reduce the incidence of replacement of the abutment. This is pretty much the only thing that I'm trying to do. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we need to measure the actual load regime. And I underline actual, because that's probably the key words. If we do measurements in a very experimental way, we may have some results that are very comprehensive, but not necessarily very reflective of what the amputees are actually doing in their normal life. Therefore, if we base uh, the uh, design of the uh, implant or the fixation on data only collected during gait analysis, that might not actually be sufficiently uh, strong or, or, or thorough. So um, just to give you an overview of, of the uh, uh, production of, of the project that I'm, uh, that I'm leading, we so far published about 42 articles, which include mainly uh, 42 publications, including mainly 11 articles. I didn't put the grant, but we've got uh, so far since 2000 about 14 grants, ab about $840,000 all combined. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you an overview of the results that we got since we started. I'm not going to go into too much details because most of it has been published and there's no point getting on any details of the curves. But what I would like to do is to give you an idea for all of you who are trying to develop um, implants, what sort of measurements you can do that will help you to understand the nature of the load that your fixation has to be able to bear. Um, like I said, if we want to measure the uh, load applied on the uh, fixations, we can do that in a gate lab, or you can do that using a uh, uh, system of this kind. I don't know if, yeah. So basically what you see here is the process is the way we use it. This is the, uh, usually the amputees are fitted with their usual prosthesis, so that's very ecological measurements. Eventually, in some cases, uh, we have to drop the knee a little bit. When I say we, it's mainly Eva when we do the testing in Gothenburg. Uh, but the major thing that we use is a little uh, 
transducer here that is actually placed between the knee and the abutment. The abutment is sticking out. What you see here is the device that will uh, protect the abutment against a larger torque, so it's a protective device. But in that case, we can consider that the load are transmitted directly from the abutment, well, from the knee to the abutment. So we've got a fairly realistic and intimate measurements of the load applied. And we did, that, we did use that in a number of instances. Pretty much we've done all the measurements we can do from the time the, the stage two is completed. Uh, the stage two for uh, the opera system is when the abutment is, is inserted into the fixation. So we've measured at every stage of the rehabilitation all the way to uh, their uh, activities of daily living. So one of the first things that we measured is, act is actually the different ways to do the load-bearing exercises. Uh, there are different uh, places in the world where people do load-bearing exercises. So we've actually done, me done some measurement on that. The way it's monitored at the moment is using a bathroom scales. So that will give you only the magnitude of the forces applied on the vertical axis, which is turned out to be quite different uh, from the load applied on the long axis of the abutment. And maybe more importantly, there is actually forces applied on the other axis. And maybe more importantly, there are the moments applied around the um, abutment that we actually didn't really know what sort of magnitude. One of them might be due to the fact that they had to slightly bend over to look at the scale and therefore introduce a larger moment. In some cases, it's actually the moment is larger than the moment that they will actually exert when they walk. So that's quite an interesting from a uh, point of view of, of promoting osteo integration. Um, the next uh, type of activities we looked at are the so-called dynamic load-bearing exercises. So a weight a, a, a is applied on the abutment, but not quite close to 100% of the body weight. There are different exercises, such as uh, doing some cycling. So we've done the analysis, where well, we're in the process of doing the analysis with the cycling. That could be doing some rowing exercise, some adduction, abduction. This is an amputee in London. Um, that's fairly active and quite, it was into bodybuilding before, so it's, it's probably not quite the normal type of amputee we will, we will see. But the interest of doing this type of measurements is it will give us an idea of the magnitude that the abutment could actually uh, bear for an amputee that do things that are quite extreme. So we are at the further end of the spectrum as far as uh, load measurement is concerned. And uh, even more extreme are the flexion extension. Um, the second step is to use walking aids, and the idea is to help them to walk, and uh, also they sometimes are prescribed to use walking aids to, uh, as a load relief and a safety um, device, although they can perfectly walk without the walking aids in most cases, but in order to reduce the load, uh, they might be uh, prescribed to use a load, uh, uh, um, a, um, and a walking aid. So what we've done is we've done the measurements with two different types, three different types of, of walking aids uh, with two crutches, one cane and no uh, walking aids. And that will, give you an that will give us an idea of the actual load relief that, it's, um, that occur when you use uh, walking aids. Um, after that, we did some standardized daily activities. And when I say standardized, that means they are all the time the same for every patient. So you can actually have a much easier patient to patient comparison. It's they all do the same thing. The typical one is the uh, uh, walking. And one of the things that probably I, I will, if, you had, if there is only one message to take away from, from this presentation, that will, that will probably be on this slide. So if you wanted to do some measurements and do the analysis, this is pretty much the way I will recommend to do the analysis. The first one is to look at the pattern of the curves. What you've got here is the one trial. You've got the um, gate cycle with the support, the, well, the full gate cycle. And what you've got here is the load applied during the support phase. And what you've got here is the load applied during an extended number of steps. By the way, you cannot measure such a high number of steps in a gate lab because you are constrained by the force plates and the field of view of your cameras. And uh, so that's the kind of data we're looking at. When other researchers in the gate lab are looking at one gate cycle, we can easily look in at 60 or an unlimited number for that, for that matter. So you've got the, the red curve uh, is give you the mean and the uh, blue curves behind uh, is the, um, 
actual value. They all be normalized to fit uh, around the mean uh, through a 100% uh, um, interval. So the first thing that we're looking at is the pattern of the curve. The second thing is actually looking at the temporal variable, which is the duration of the gate cycle, duration of the uh, support and swing phase expressed in seconds or in percentage of the gate cycle. This is for clinicians the typical thing they will look at. The transducer is not particularly good to give us some information because it can only give us temporal information. They use, clinicians usually use much more comprehensive sets of measurements named spatial temporal variable, which looking at also distances uh, between different ill contacts and uh, between the foot. So we cannot do that with the transducer. We need to rely on, on video data for that. But nonetheless, that gives us a bit of an idea of the functional level of the amputee. The second thing we're looking at is what I define as the local extrema, which is the point of extreme within the curve that will correspond to a specific pattern. So for the vertical forces, that's pretty classic. You've got the first peak and the second peak. By the way, in most amputees fitted with a socket, the last peak is usually very small because the sinoplate cannot push as much as towards the end of the support. But transfer amputee fitted with an implant tend to have a fairly similar curve than the ones for able bodies. The other thing that we're looking at is the loading rate. This is not very well described in the literature. Actually, we have, well, I suppose I should say I, um, came up with the way to analyze the data. And that relies on the, the, the plotting a straight line between two local extrema and looking at the angle of this straight line um, and looking at the data not normalized in, in time-wise, but just looking at the um, um, this axis is expressed in seconds. So that will give us an idea of the variations between patients in term, taking into consideration the time difference and the magnitude of the load which you can, with a single value that's the same for everyone. Okay? If you do the normal analysis, you will normalize the time by 100%. So you actually put every, every single steps and every single patient at the same time scale. So you don't see actually some of the distortion and some of the variation between patients simply because you're not looking at all the parameters. The last thing that we're looking at is the impulse. The impulse from the physical uh, mechanical definition is the area under the curve of the force. But in, in this, so that's the area underneath here. But in this um, context, we use that more as a clinical indicator that will represent the level of usage of the processes. The easy way to understand this value is the higher it is, the more the amputee is putting some load on the um, fixations. And you can do that in too many ways. In two ways, you could have a high peak for a very short period of time, or you could have a very spread out force for a longer period of time, and the result will be, in that case, the same. What I'm going to do now is to go through uh, briefly uh, examples of the, some of our findings. So this is the results from the temporal variable, and I don't know if it's very clear on the graph, but what you've got see what you've got here is the duration of the swig phases, the duration of the support phase, and the duration of the cycle. These bits here correspond to able bodies. This is amputated fitted with a uh, fixation, and this is the amputee fitted with a socket. And probably if you spend a bit more time to look at the graph, what you will see is that amputated fitted with the fixations are the, the best of amputees fitted with the fixations are performing as well as the least performers of the able body. Okay, I say that again. The most, well, the most capable amputees fitted with the fixations are as good as the worst able bodies. So that gives us an indication of uh, how the um, prosthetic benefit of the implant is actually translated into functional outcome. The other things that we looked at is obviously the lo uh, local extrema, the peak value for uh, walking and the forces. Uh, this is obviously a very big table. I'm not expecting you to look at the numbers. What I was uh, trying, the point that I was trying to make here is that typically when we look at uh, the variability for, one sub for a given subject, there is very low variability. So every subject tend to do the same things 
again and again. However, the interesting point is that they tend to have, the cohort tend to have a very high participant, participant variability. Okay? So, uh, two conclusions, the, well, to point to that. The first one is that's mainly because we did measurements with a very um, um, non-normalized cohort. We just took the amputee as they were with their current prosthesis and we just wanted to, to know the loading. We did what in biomechanics is called a very ecological measurements. We didn't alter the, alter the uh, we didn't normalize confounders. That's really what it means. So, um, and it could be one explanation. The other uh, point that it's interesting to make with this kind of data is that one, um, you cannot really design your uh, fixations on the basics that one model will fit all. Because as a matter of fact, the implant that's designed has to be able to accommodate quite a very high variability between a group of 12 amputees. Uh, we look at also the impulse, and that will be the same outcome, very low uh, subject to subject, uh, intra-subject variability, but very high subject to subject variability. Uh, so that was for the uh, so-called standardized activity walking. Now we also did some standardized activities uh, that looking at uh, very similar activities that Todd presented earlier, uh, without the classical activities, uh, going up and down the stairs, up and down the slope, walking around, around the circle. There are three reasons why we choose those activities. The first one is because the amputee has to perform them in their normal life. So that's part of what they need to do. If you want to tuck uh, sheets under a bed, you need to go around a square, the bed. Uh, the second reason is because we wanted to measure the maximum load on a certain type of activities. For example, we wanted to know what was the maximum torque applied on the fixation. That's why we asked them to, to walk around a circle with the leg inside so that we can actually exaggerate the torsion. And the last reason is because most of the knee, prosthetic component knee, uh, that have been, uh, are designed to perform well in some of those activities. For example, the sea leg is designed to uh, facilitate going up, oh, sorry, going up and down stairs. So uh, by doing that, we are providing actually quite interesting results on the way the amputee work with certain type of processes, but also uh, potentially interesting results for the industry because that's the kind of data they will need to design better prosthetic component. Um, interest, another interesting point in those uh, slides is everything is done in a very, very ecological environment. There's no camera, there's no markers. The amputee are really doing what they normally do. Um, this is give you, uh, to give you an idea of the, um, sorry, of the uh, um, local extrema. It was probably more interesting in terms of looking at the magnitude, but I won't bore you with that. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is, so, so far we've got, we've got measurements in a very normalized conditions, which are good to compare between subject and between activities. Nonetheless, it's still not very reflective of the level of loading that an amputee do in their normal daily life. So the idea was then to place the transducer um, at the bottom of an, an abutment and let an amputee walk and do what they normally do in their normal life. And if you do that, you will have this kind of results for a, a five hours recording. This is the actual level of activity of, of an amputee. Um, am I running short of time? Um, I'll be finished soon. So basically what you see here is a period of activity and inactivities. And we had to come up with a fairly well, quite elaborate way to analyze the data by looking at different type of activities, the inactivities, the directional locomotion, the radius uh, ambulation, and the stationary loading. Basically, those things are quite easy to monitor, but the interesting bit is what it's called, uh, I don't call it radius ambulation now, I call it localized locomotion, which is a little set of steps that you do in your normal life. This is pretty much what I've been doing since the beginning of the presentation that actually in some cases are equivalent of 50% of the load you apply. So if you do typical measurements in the gate lab, you've got the load, uh, the, uh, one gate cycle, and you've got a pedometer that will give you a number of steps, and you multiply those two, that will give you uh, the load. But if you do that, you're actually missing 50% of the overall loading. That's quite significant in some cases. Uh, so this is describing a little bit more in details the different uh, periods. Uh, we can look at them in terms of occurrence and duration. And this is typically what we're looking at for every uh, periods of, of recording when we're looking at the uh, mean, 
and the maximum and median value are around the three axis. Uh, same thing for the impulse. Another thing that we, um, I don't know if I should say lucky, but one of the amputees fell when we did some testing. So we were in the unique position to actually measure the load during the fall, which is probably one of the main reasons why the abutment has to be changed, because they fell, the abutment gets bent and needs to be changed. So that will give you an idea of the, magnit of the magnitude of the load that's applied on the abutment during the fall. This has just been published, it's widely available now. Uh, the other thing that we look at from the uh, data is we use that as input for finite element model that we're looking at the risk of failure and the distribution of the load within the abutment. Another, another thing that we, uh, so this finite element model is looking at um, more the, uh, the structure of the, um, of the uh, abutment. All those things, what I do is, uh, my job is to look at the load itself and to do the measurements, and after that I'm very happy to collaborate with a range of people who could do clever things with it. And this is the, what clever people do with things. So finite element model. The other thing that we can look at is actually how the, uh, the correlation between the load and the tightening torque of the abutment. Uh, another interesting factor is looking at the inverse dynamics. Typically, when you want to measure the load, you will, use, you will use a set of equations named inverse dynamics. When you use the vid video data, the force plate data, and you calculate the forces applied at the ankle, the knee, and the hip. So we can, with the, so the inverse dynamic calculate the load while the transducer measure the load. So we can compare those two and define some kind of validity of the gate lab, uh, looking at the hip uh, joint or the heat power. And roughly what we're trying to do with that is to improve the design of the component, to uh, improve the rehabilitation program and the fitting of the prosthesis, and hopefully those two combined will help to aim to fit the purpose, which is shortening the rehabilitation program and reduce the incidence of replacement of the abutment. Sorry, I hope it wasn't too late. Thanks a lot, uh, Laurent. Enormous amount of data, enormous amount of very, very good techniques, I must say. This paper is now open for discussion. I don't know, we're continuing with another symposium here, okay? Uh, but, so I, I guess we, we're in a little bit rush of time. Um, but, please, come with questions. I'm sorry, it's not against you, Laura. No, 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 I'll, I'll be around, so if people want but to ask me. But please, questions. if we have a, a, some questions. If not, uh, thanks again, Laurent. And this, uh, this ends this uh, session, and I would like to thank you for your...